All right, it is a pleasure to be here with you all tonight and just say, I just need to say God bless Steadfast Baptist Church. I uh, really appreciate your uh, strong stand and, and having to deal with all the various problems that Steadfast Baptist Church had to deal with over the years. And uh, it really is a testament to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that you're still here, you're growing, you haven't gone anywhere, and uh, you continue to grow and, and stand on the Word of God. And, you know, it, it, it says a lot when you have your own welcoming committee outside that uh, volunteers. Actually, I don't think they volunteer. They're probably paid by, by some God-haters. Um, either way, uh, you've, got, you've got a nice welcoming committee out there. But, um, no, I, I appreciate Pastor Shelley. I appreciate all the work that you all do here, um, not just for, for the preaching, but everything that goes on here, all the, all the cool things, all the activities you got. It's really great. It's good to be here. And it's a great uh, seeing everybody again, new faces, old faces. Um, so I appreciate the, the offer and the invite to be here. So, all right, let's get into the sermon this evening. We started off reading in Hebrews chapter number 11, which is commonly known as a faith chapter. And obviously, uh, uh, faith is, is fundamental in, uh, in everything we believe here. Now, the Bible tells us there in verse number one, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. Our faith is supposed to dictate how we walk, how we act, the decisions that we make is all based on faith. You know, you start with that original faith of just trusting in Jesus Christ as your Savior. That's the most important faith. That's the faith that you need just to be born again, to become a child of God. But obviously, that's not where our faith stops. Uh, we need to continue to grow in our faith. Once you're a child of God, you start living like a child of God, you start making decisions, and all of your actions ought to be formed by faith. But what is faith? Faith is, is, is like the Bible says here, it's the evidence of things not seen. So the things that we believe in, when we trust in the Word of God, we don't get to see all of the promises played out in this lifetime. Now, we get to see many of them. Of course, the Word of God rings true through and through. So when the Bible talks about things, uh, um, even just regular truths, you go through the book of Proverbs, the, the Bible rings true over and over and over and over again, but we, we, we trust the Word of God, we trust Proverbs, we pr trust all the books of the Bible, and we ought to be trusting that to, to help us to understand the world around us and understand what's best and what's right for us and how we ought to be living our life on the day-to-day -day basis. We see there in verse number 10 of Hebrews 11, uh, the Bible says, For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. So, you know, Abraham is, is following the word of God, but he's not looking for a physical city. He's not looking for the physical Israel. He's going where God's directing him to, but he's looking for the city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. He's looking for the heavenly Jerusalem. He's looking for a heavenly city. That is what is guiding him and directing him is that faith in the unseen. Uh, verse 27 there too, if you jump down verse number 27, the Bible says, By faith he forsook Egypt, referring to Moses, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. So we see in this passage multiple times over and over again, people who are making decisions and they're seeing what is invisible. And one of the things that the Bible is able to do, and if turn if you would to, to 2 Kings chapter number 6, is that when we, when we look through the lens of the Bible, of the Word of God, when you can put on these spiritual glasses, as it were, you're going to see things as they are in truth. We get to see the world around us for what it really is. Because there's a lot of deception out there, and there's a lot of, of, of false ideas, there's a lot of, of deception, there's a lot of facades trying to make you think that something is great, or something is good, or something is true, when in reality, it's false, it's wicked, you know, it's something that you want to avoid. And the Bible is going to help us to be able to, to put on these special glasses, these spiritual glasses that's going to help us to be able to see Clearly, we got a good example of this happening in 2 Kings chapter number 6, verse number 15. The Bible reads, And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, an host compassed the city both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? 
And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Elisha is already wearing the spiritual glasses. He already knows what's going on. He doesn't have to worry about this host of horses and chariots. But see, his servant, he didn't have that same faith or the same understanding. He didn't see things quite as clearly as Elisha did. And honestly, I mean, if you think about putting yourself in those shoes, and all of a sudden, it's just you and Elisha. And you're going along, and all of a sudden, there's an entire army. There's chariots, there's horses. You've got all these people surrounding, and you're surrounded. And it's like, well, what are we going to do, right? And, and he's going, I, I don't know what to do, right? How could you possibly fight against an army? And Elisha's like, yeah, don't worry about it. Don't sweat it. No big deal. You know what? Those that are on our side, those that are with us right now, are more than that are with them. There's even no reason to fear. Elisha wasn't troubled. He wasn't feared at all, even though this, this huge army showed up against them. Verse 17, the Bible reads, and Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. The Lord had already sent his angels, those guardian angels, to go and protect Elisha, the man of God, and his servant. Elisha knew this. He's walking by faith. And I personally, I don't believe that Elisha, Elisha literally saw all those angels. I mean, we don't know. It's not spelled out for us in scripture. But he knew that they were there. Why? Because he had the faith. Because he, he, he doesn't need to see the unseen to believe. He had that trust in the word of God already and was able to, to act and not be concerned because his faith was so strong. But what was reality? So the, the view of reality from the servant is that, hey, we're all alone in this. It's just the two of us against an entire army. But what was the reality of the situation? No, you're not alone. No, in fact, you have defenders that literally were there ready to defend and protect you so that you're not, not a hair from your head's going to fall. But they weren't able to see, you know, he's only able to see that when he was able to put on those spiritual glasses and be able to see things for what they really are. And Elisha helped them to see that. Of course, he prayed to the Lord, God, open up his eyes. Let, let him see what's really going on here. Now turn, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. One of the main reasons we can't see things in this world for the way that they are is because there's so much deception, as I just mentioned a, little, a few minutes ago. And that deception comes from uh, the one that's known as the God of this world, which would be Satan, right? The devil. And what we need to understand is that Satan is a great con man. Satan is a deceiver. He's the deceiver, right? He's an accuser of the brethren. He's, he's anti-Christ. He's anti-God and, and wants nothing more than to deceive the people and always cast out on the word of God and, and just do wickedness but but the way that he does so see there's this false view that that people in general at least the american culture has been programmed with about who the devil is as like you know the the red guy with the the pointy tail and the pitchfork right you see that in cartoons you see these other things and people just kind of think that like oh of course i would know the devil if i saw him but the reality is you might not Right? Un unless you start to know and understand and have faith in God's word to be able to see the characteristics and the attributes of the devil, then you might be able to see. But if you're just relying on your physical sight and what this world's trying to tell you, look, the Satan's trying to, to convince people that he's a good guy, that he doesn't exist, that, 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 that oh, you have it all misunderstood. You don't, really, you don't really know who I am and will try to play on your weaknesses and, and, and gain your confidence. Because that's what a con man does, is they want to gain your confidence, right? They want you to, to think that everything is great and um, there, there's no problem, nothing to see here. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 13, for such are false prophets, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. So some of the worst people these false prophets that are out to, to destroy and, and tear down people's faith and literally lead people to hell are people that transform themselves into the apostles of Christ. So what better way to look like a good guy than to put on the attire and try to make themselves look like one of the apostles? 
Right? That's, that's of anyone who's going to have your confidence, like, wow, one of the apostles of Jesus Christ, of course I'm going to listen to that person, I'm going to trust that person, I'm going to believe that person. So people who are going to inherently receive so much confidence from people, of course, that's what the con man's going to look to and be like, oh, okay, I'm going to try to step in there. That's why, you know, the Bible talks about a, a wolf in sheep's clothing. Well, to all the sheep, you're going to be comfortable around another sheep, right? You don't want to be around a wolf, but that's why the wolf puts on the sheep's clothing to make themselves appear that way. And Satan is no different. The Bible says in verse 14, it says, And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. And it, you, I mean, we literally have people today that are Luciferians, that, that, that believe in Lucifer as a light bearer, as, oh, he's a good guy, and, and really, God the Father is a bad guy, and, and you know, Satan's misunderstood, and he's trying to bring wisdom, and he's trying to, to help out man and, and let them know the things that God's trying to withhold, all, the, all this nonsense. And this is how Satan works. He's going to look like an angel of light. He's going to try to look like a good guy. And we need to be aware of this. And through the word of God, we can help to look past and see through the facade and see through the lies and see through the, uh, the, the, the lies and disinformation that's out there about things that are actually wicked. Verse number 15 says, Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers be, uh, also be transformed as ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. And of course, we see, uh, you don't have to turn if you would to Proverbs chapter 6. Revelation 12, 9 uh, talks about Satan. It says, And the great dragon was cast out, the old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. And he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So we know that the devil is trying to deceive the whole world, as Scripture says. He's been hard at work at deceiving the whole world. We need to see through the lies and see the truth and put on the spiritual glasses. If you didn't go by now, it's all my sermon is spiritual glasses. So we, went, we want to put on those spiritual glasses. And I was thinking about this and I hesitated bringing it up, but it was, it's kind of a good example. Um, if you haven't seen this movie, I don't recommend it. You know, it's, it's a, it just, just put it this way, the movie I'm going to reference had a, a WWF wrestler in it a long time ago, Rowdy Roddy Piper. For those of you that might know, if you know, you know. Okay, there's a movie called They Live. But here, here's the thing about that movie, right? So there were these uh, aliens or whatever that had come down to Earth, and they looked like regular people. But they were literally controlling human beings. And, and Rowdy Piper got his hands on his glasses so he can see it. Like, there are these conspiracy nuts that were saying, oh, man, there's aliens here, and they're controlling us and stuff. I was like, what are you talking about, you conspiracy theorists? And he got these glasses, and when he put on the glasses, he was like, oh, there you go. <laughs> whoa. Like, like, he sees people, instead of seeing their face, they look like kind of skeletal or something. They just look like these, these aliens. He's just, like, freaking out, and he's like, you know, so he could, he could see things as they actually were, and you could see the billboards. So you look at a billboard, and it's like, you put it on, it says obey, and it says, you know, like all this stuff. He could see through the lies. But it, it, it was a pretty good example because the Bible will help us to be able to see through the lies and the propaganda and the misinformation that the world wants to put out there. Because there's a lot of that going on. I mean, it was, it was really reflective of things that really happen in our culture. Because there are a lot of wicked people at work. There's principalities and powers in play that is our fight. That, that are trying to deceive you into doing wicked things, into believing wrong things, and to lead you into lies and not the truth. And we need to be able to put on those spiritual glasses. So one of the easiest things that, that I think we could start off with tonight, I'm going to go through various issues that the world's going to try to deceive you about, that Satan's going to try to deceive you about, but through the lens of the Bible, we could see clearly. Now, I don't know about you, but when I go out and preach the gospel, I, go, I love going to Revelation 21.8 to try to just show people, hey, everyone is, is worthy of hell, right? Now, when I was growing up, sometimes I share this with people like, hey, I don't know about you, but, but you know, when I was growing up, I used to think I was going to heaven because I wasn't really that bad of a guy. 
You know, I didn't, I wasn't trying to hurt people or kill people or do anything bad to people. I just wanted to do good and be a good person. So I'm like, yeah, I, I'm, yeah, I've sinned before. I acknowledge I've done wrong. I know I'm not perfect, but I just kind of felt like, yeah, I'm a pretty good guy, right? So, so of course, I'm going to go to heaven because I'm really not that bad. And Revelation 21.8, of course, illustrates that even though you may not think you're that bad of a guy, you know, all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And, I'll, and I reference say, look, I, I didn't know that when I was younger. I didn't think that way. Why? Because the world was saying, hey, what's the big deal? And even oftentimes, as we talk about these things, we say, well, I mean, you're a liar. Have you lied before? Yeah, I've lied. of course, everyone's lied. And you could almost make light of it and just kind of laugh about it. Like, well, of course, everyone's a liar. Ha, ha, yeah, but we need to see things through God's eyes. It's easy to just fall into the trap of just saying, well, yeah, I mean, I mean is it really that big of a deal, though? I mean, come on. What, no one's going to be judging the lies if everybody's lying, right? Because no one wants to be a hypocrite. And you want to downplay whatever wickedness or sin that you have in your own life. But you know what? That's why it's all the more important that we put on those spiritual glasses. See, you're, I mean, and it could be anything. The easiest thing, well, hey, did you, did you do this? Did you break that? You know, the kids, did, were you playing ball now? Did you break that? No. Well, that's a lie. And we could laugh about that because it's so common. But we ought not to be laughing about that, especially when you look at like Revelation 21 8 says, All liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Or how about, oh hey, son, just just tell them that you're tell them that you're six. I know you're eight, just tell them that you're six. Look, we ought not to be to be, you know, teaching our children, especially, to be telling lies. You know, the world's gonna say, Well, what's the big deal? That's just smart. Yeah, of course you should, you know. Who cares? It's not going to hurt anybody. Well, you need to go look at the, at the Bible and go, well, hold on a second. Look at verse number 16 there. These six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him, a proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, and heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift to running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. I don't know about you, but when I look at the, the, the six things, yea, seven are an abomination, lies are mentioned twice. I mean, if you're going to list only seven things, and two of them are exactly the same, maybe we should pay attention to that. And be like, yeah, you know what, maybe a lie is kind of a big deal. If God's going to make it something that's worthy of the lake of fire, maybe we ought to treat it a little bit more seriously. And, you know, we could, we could look at these things. You say, oh, what's a big deal here? What's a big deal there? You know what the big deal is? Here's the big deal about lying. We're expecting people, one, to trust the word of God. Imagine if God told one lie. What if God told one lie? Just, just one. It was just one. I mean, it was just that one time. I told how How confident are you going to be and believing any of his word. We need to raise children. We need ourselves to be people who are people of our word. You know, someone's word used to mean something. It used to be a big deal. Hey, if I say something, that ought to be good enough for you. But we live in a culture that's so full of liars that, like, you can't take anyone at their word anymore. If you say you're going to be somewhere, if you're going to say you're going to do something, then do it. Don't make yourself a liar. Because then who's going to want to believe your testimony about anything? You ruin that, that opportunity. Look, the, the, the Bible is without error. That's why we can trust it. God doesn't lie. God cannot lie. So we can trust in the truth of God's word because it, it is true. But if you want people to believe you, if you want your kids to believe you, if you want strangers to believe you, look, stay true to your word. Don't, don't believe the lie that, well, I mean, is it really that big of a deal? Is it really worth saving a few bucks on a kid's meal or whatever, you know, whatever the, the, the thing is that you want to lie and get away with? Like, is it really worth it? If you're going to end up Teaching your kids, oh, yeah, it's not that big of a deal. When Scripture says how big of a deal it really is. 
and that's just one thing. We're gonna, look, we got a lot of things that we can go through tonight. Don't worry, I don't have two sermons prepared for you tonight. We're going to get to the, to the food. And um, I can read military time, so <laughs> don't worry about that. We're, we're, you're in good shape. I wasn't even in the military. Turn, if you would, to Proverbs 23. <laughs> Proverbs 23, you know, there's another lie that, that's circled around, even amongst Christians, you know, definitely out in the world, but even amongst Christianity, and that has to do with just, how about drinking alcohol? You see the billboard signs, you see the TV shows, right? I hope you don't, but, but if you're looking at all of the media that's pushed out there, it's commonplace, it's normal. You have people in a really nice fancy house and they're drinking a glass of wine and they're drinking a beer and they're having whatever, and it, and it just played out to be, it's normal, it's great, there's nothing wrong with this. But what does the Bible say? Look at Proverbs 23, <laughs> verse number 31. I mean, Satan's going to tell you, hey, everyone, dr everyone drinks. Everyone drinks. Come on, buddy. We're, hey, we're all going out to the bar after work. Don't be so stiff. Lighten up, man. It's not a big deal. Just have one drink. Just one. Hey, oh, you're a Christian? Jesus turned water into wine. <laughs> I mean, what more do you need? It's a Christian thing to do. Let's go have a glass of wine. Well, look at verse number 31. Bible says, look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth its color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright at the last, it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. Thine eyes shall behold strange women and thine heart shall utter perverse things. Look, these things happen when you drink booze. This is the truth from the word of God. The world's never going to tell you about this. Satan isn't going to tell you how horrible it is, how it's like poison, how it's like a serpent sting, how you're going to behold strange women and your heart is going to utter perverse things. Hey, you know that word perverse? You know another word that's associated with perverse? Perverted. Do you want to be a pervert? Do you want your heart to utter perverted things? Drink alcohol. Hey, this is the truth from God's word. Let's keep reading. He says, Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast. They have stricken me, shalt thou say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. There is so much truth in this one short passage about drinking wine, drinking alcohol. And obviously, it matters when it becomes alcoholic. That's when you don't drink it. And I'm not going to get all into every aspect of, of drinking. It, it, it's, a, it's a personal subject for me because it's something that I was deceived by earlier in my life. And, and I can't scream loud enough about this subject. And, and it hits home. And look, kids, don't ever be deceived by some kid. You know, peer pressure, you grow up someday, you go out on the job or you have some friends like, hey, man, we're all going to. We're going to get a six-pack. We're going to get a case of beer, man. Come on over. We're going to get a keg. Oh, man, it's so great. Oh, you've never drank before? Oh, it's so much fun. And people talk about their experience and getting drunk. And, and really what getting drunk is is acting the fool. It's all it is. And that's why people want to get everyone else drunk around them so that everybody can be a fool together so you don't have one person who's like, you guys are a bunch of idiots. You're a bunch of fools, right? So just try to get everybody drunk around you because it does. It, it makes you act stupid. And at the end of the day, you know, well, well, you shouldn't need to experience sin for yourself. Thank God that he gives us spiritual glasses. So you don't have to try it for yourself. Walk by faith. You say, I've never drank before. But yeah, but you should believe the Bible. Believe what the word of God says. Because it's true. You don't have to go through everything in order to know what's true. You tr did you trust the, the Bible for your salvation? Did you trust Jesus to save you? I mean, you haven't met him personally, physically, have you? You trust him for that. You trust the word of God to save your soul. Well, how about you trust it in all areas of life? In, in every, every reference to alcoholic beverages in Scripture are negative. 
Isaiah 19, 14 says, the, the Lord hath mingled a perverse spirit in the midst thereof, and they have caused Egypt to err in every work thereof, as a drunketh man staggereth in his vomit. vomit. It's not a very pretty picture of, of drinking, is it? But, but it happens. This is why he's bringing it up. Is that you're just like the drunk that staggers in his own vomit. Because that's what happens. Isaiah 28, verse 7, the Bible says, But they also have erred through wine, and through strong drink are out of the way. Talking about the priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink. They've erred. They're in error. They're deceived. They're swallowed up of wine. They're out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. For all tables are full of vomit and filthiness that there is no place. So when the world's going to say, oh, look, alcohol is going to make you the life of the party. And it's going to, you know, you're going to get more friends and everyone's going to like you. You know what I see? I see vomit. I see perversion. I see foolish speaking. I see people who get sick and wounded without a cause. I see poison. I mean, who's going to ever advocate for taking poison? Like, here, just have a little bit of poison. Just a little bit. Just have a little poison. It's good for you. Seriously. Turn if we went to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. <laughs> Uh oh, <laughs> we got a whole list of things here. How much time we got? <laughs> First Corinthians chapter five. I'm only going to focus on one from this passage. What does the world tell us about? What does Satan want you to think about fornication? Oh, you're in love, right? We love each other, and this is look. This is so common these days. It's disgusting. It used to not be tolerated. It used to be frowned upon as a society. Now it's just, oh, yeah, me and my boyfriend, we're going to go, and we got an apartment, and we're, we're living together. I don't know. We might get married in the next five years. We'll see how it goes. We're going to see how compatible we are, you know, and, and we'll just, we'll just kind of see how it goes. And then we're expecting a, a, a baby. Oh, it's okay. We love each other. That's, that's what the world, that's what Satan wants to tell you. But what does the Bible say? <laughs> Second, you're in 1 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 12, 21 says, Unless when I come again, my God will humble me among you, and, <clears throat> hold on. <laughs> and that I shall bewail many, <laughs> which have sinned already and have not repented of the uncleanness and fornication and lasciviousness which they have committed. Fornication is tied with uncleanness, lasciviousness in Scripture. The Bible says in Ephesians 5, 3, but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. It ought not to even be named, just like alcohol not to even be looked at. You shouldn't even be looking on the wine when it's red, and we shouldn't even be naming fornication even once among you that are saints. You're a child of God. God forbid that you'd be living in fornication with somebody. In fact, it's so wicked. If you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, the Bible says there in verse number 1, it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. And ye are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. He's saying instead of being in, in mourning and sad and sorry that someone in your congregation is committing such a wicked act of fornication, he's saying instead, you're just puffed up. Oh, yeah. No big deal, right? Of course. Hey, everybody's welcome in here. No big deal. We don't have any standards. Uh, no, you ought to have standards, which is why, oh, you're so judgmental. Well, Let's see what the Bible says. Verse 3, For I verily as absent in body but present in spirit have judged already. Look, I'm not even there. And I can judge this matter because it's so simple, it's so basic. You're so deceived by this world and to think that fornication is not a big deal. Even something so wicked that a, a man would have his father's wife in fornication. It's disgusting and perverted. He's saying you guys ought to be mourning. This ought to really upset you. Instead, you're just puffed up. 
Not a big deal. Oh, yeah, what do you, who do you think you are? I've judged already. Verse 4, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Sounds like a pretty serious sin to me. But again, that Satan's not going to want you to think that way. Satan's not going to want you to believe that. Oh, what's a marriage license? Just a piece of paper. Right? The world will tell you that. All the stinking rock music and the popular music out here is going to teach you that. The, the, the epistle goes on here in chapter 5. Verse number 9 says, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or with idolaters, for then must you need to go out of the world. But now I've written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such an one know not to eat. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within. He's like, don't you, don't you judge the people that are within, within the church, within the house of God? Because you ought to be. But them that are without God, look, you, you, you can't worry about every sin that everyone out in the world is going to do. But you know what? We need to hold a high standard within the house of God. Amen. Among those that are saints, that are sanctified through the blood of Jesus Christ. Hey, we're going to live to a higher standard than the world. Amen. We're going to set ourselves apart. Verse 13 says, but them that are without God judges, therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. The Bible's calling them a wicked person. And obviously there's a bunch of things listed there, but what's the first thing listed? If, any brother, if anyone has called a brother, be a fornicator. You know, if you're, and if you're a fornicator, you better get that fixed now because you really shouldn't even be uh, gathering together. If you're called a brother, if you're saved, if you're someone that's known as a brother, you need to get that fixed now. Now. You don't wait on something like that. Oh, but we have this apartment and we have to pay rent. I don't care. You think God cares about how much you have to pay in rent as you're fornicating with your, with your partner? I don't see, like the world wants to show you, a loving couple starting their life together. I see wickedness. I see uncleanness. I don't see a reason to congratulate people. Oh, you're not married and you're having a baby? Oh, congratulations. Oh, let's throw you a baby shower. Oh, that's so wonderful. You know, uh, isn't that just a blessing from God? No. You know what Deuteronomy 23, 2 says? A bastard shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Even to his 10th generation shall he not enter in the congregation of the Lord. I don't see this great bundle of joy blessing for unmarried people having a child. I see a bastard. <coughs> now, obviously, that's not the child's fault. But you know what, parents? Why are you going to be bringing bastards into this world? I think we need less bastards, not more. And speaking of children, when it comes to raising children, you know, Satan's going to want to have you think, oh, a loving parent, they'll never strike a child. You, know, you, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't show them that, right? You can't be violent. Look, you shouldn't be violent toward your child. But people want to conflate uh, uh, a biblical punishment with violence. Two totally different things. And if, you are, if you're violent toward your children, don't be violent, right? But that's a far cry from being, you know, oh, just put them in time out. Explain to them why they're wrong and that they shouldn't do that. And then tell them they're bad and point your finger at them. And then that's the punishment. No. The Bible says in Proverbs 13, 24, He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. So what do I see? I see, oh, you don't spank your child? You hate him. But that's what the Bible teaches. The world's going to tell you you hate your child if you spank them. Uh, I'm going to trust God's word over what the world has to say. Amen. 
Turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 7. Here's one fitting for the times. The world talks about, in, in Christianity especially, the nation that's flying the Star of David. But they love the Old Testament, the Star of David. They're God's people. You know what? I, I don't see God's chosen people anymore in the Middle East that are involved in their, in their warfare. Look at verse number 42 in Acts chapter 7. Let, let's get the biblical view on this. Right? I mean, can Christians please get a biblical view on this? That would be nice. That would be refreshing. If we could actually look to the Bible for our guidance and direction on, on how we should view current events and a nation of people that want to wave a flag and, and it, that has this six-pointed star. I mean, I literally was driving home. Whenever this stuff broke out, I was driving home, and there's this, this house on my way home from work that always has this Jesus save sign out there, right? And recently I was driving back after all this stuff happened, and now, now they've got American flag and this, uh, this, this six-pointed star flag out in front of their house. I'm just thinking, like, man, this is so, like, you're a Christian. I thought you are a Christian. You look like, you're, you're advertising that you're a Christian, but now you've got this, this star flag outside of your house. Look at verse number 42 in Acts 7. The Bible says, Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven. As it is written in the book of the prophets, O ye house of Israel, have ye offered to me slain beasts and sacrifices by the space of 40 years in the wilderness? Yea, ye took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your God, Remphan. You want to look for, for a banner for taking up a star in Scripture, this is going to be the only one that you find. We don't see David putting up a star anywhere. We see Israel taking up the star of their god, Remphan. Figures which he made to worship them, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. I see a nation replaced. Look at Matthew 21. Well, we need to bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. Come on, Christians, let's go back to Genesis and, and look at the promise that God made to Abraham. And he's saying thee, singular, to Abraham. I will bless him that blesseth thee. So when did Abraham be become a bunch of Christ-rejecting Jews? Because I, I think that the Bible talks about if you're a, a child of Abraham, then you're a child of faith. Then you're a child of the promise. Because Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. So when we're talking about the children of Abraham, we're talking about believers. It wasn't it the Pharisees that said that, that what were John the Baptist, who was preaching against the Pharisees, saying, think not to say within yourselves that we have Abraham to our father, for God is able of these stones to raise up seed unto Abraham. That's how much worth being a physical descendant of Abraham is in the New Testament. That's how much it's worth. Hey, you see that rock God's able to make of that stone? The seed of Abraham. So what? Which is why the Bible says in the New Testament, avoid genealogies. Hello, Christian, you read your Bible much? Matthew 21, verse 42. Let's hear what Jesus has to say. I mean, all of the Bible is what Jesus has to say. But look at verse number 42. Jesus saith unto them, Did ye never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected, the same as become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore say I unto you, 
the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. How about that? It's going to be taken from you and given to someone else. Kind of sounds like you've been replaced. Wait. It's taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. Or how about 1 John 2, 22, who is a liar, but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. He is antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. Well, they have the Father, just not the Son. No, they don't. No, they don't. Why in the world should we be sending support, sending aid, sending money, sending praises, sending blessings to people who literally are antichrist? How much are you for Christ if you're blessing antichrists? The nation wants you to look at, or the, the Satan wants you to look at the nation flying the star of Remphan and saying, oh, look, there are the Jews. They're the people of God. Well, Romans 2.28 says, for he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcisions have the heart in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. got one more I'm doing good on time and how do you not go to Romans 1 <laughs> I'd be remiss when we're talking about the world's lies and the deception right the sodomite deception that's out there yeah. trying to paint a picture of who a certain group of people are, that's a total lie. Yeah. And the deception runs thick because there are a lot of people that have fallen for the deception. Yeah. Thank God Steadfast Baptist Church hasn't fallen for the deception. <laughs> and if you haven't seen it, go check out the Sodomite Deception. <laughs> Find it on social media anywhere you can before it's completely nuked from the planet <laughs> for making people's heads explode. What does Satan want you to think about the homos? Rainbows. Love. Equals. Right? Equals is a good, that, that's positive. That's nice. Love is love. Norm, normal. Hey, this just needs to be taught. It's like anything else. Well. <laughs> Hold on. I want to make sure I see really clearly. Because <laughs> this just doesn't sound right to me. Something inside is just kind of revolting. And I'm already starting to think that maybe this isn't right. But just in case, let me, let me see. You know, Jude verse 7 says, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh. You know, another word for strange is queer are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So what do we learn in the New Testament about Sodom and Gomorrah? That the, the people that went after a queer flesh, they're the example of suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Huh. But that's not, I mean, that's not what Satan's telling me. That's not what the world's trying to tell me. That's not what the media's telling me. That's not what the welcoming committee is saying out there. <laughs> I don't know. Let me, let me see if there's anything else in the, in the Bible. Look at verse 26. For this cause God gave them up unto, what's that word? Vile? Vile? What is that word? I mean, this is so hard to understand, this, this King James Bible. <laughs> I mean, we should replace it with something else. I don't know. No, wait, if you, you know, there's another documentary. It's called The Preserved Word. <laughs> Go check out that documentary. It's another good one. No, that word, vile, 
means disgusting. It means repulsive, gross, vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. So, oh yeah, it's not natural, by the way. They're not born that way. You can't have sympathy for the homo by saying, oh, well, that's just how they were born. I mean, it's not their fault. Yes, it is their fault. Because it's not natural. Because they're changing the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. It's wrong. It's an error. It's vile. It's disgusting. It's, uh, they, they're set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. 2 Peter chapter 2. Turn there if you'd like. 2 Peter chapter 2. The Bible says, In turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, verse number 6, In turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemn them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly, and delivered just lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked for that righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Lot was the only guy that was saved. He was the only guy that God cared about getting out before he rained down the fire and brimstone on those wicked people in those perverted wicked acts. And while he was there, the Bible says that he was vexed. His righteous soul was vexed. It bothered him. It troubled him as every Christian ought to be troubled and bothered by the filthy conversation. And the conversation, by the way, is not just speaking. It's the way they carry themselves. It's the way that they act. It's everything about what they do. Their conversation, who they are. Vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. You know what? That overthrow just showed that they were an example. It was an example. Say, oh, that was Old Testament. Yeah, it was Old Testament for our example in the New Testament. To show us God didn't change his mind on that. Jump down to verse number 21. The Bible says, For it had been better for them not to have known the way. Now look, in context, the computer chapter 2 is broadly talking about false prophets, okay, in this context. But this is totally applicable as well because just as false prophets are reprobate, so are the sodomites. Okay, that's why they share these characteristics and these traits. Verse number 21 says, For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. Just as Romans 1 talks about, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, but became vain in their imaginations, their foolish heart was darkened. So they knew the way of righteousness, it would be better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to know it and then reject it. Because once you know it and, and you're aware and you say, no, I want nothing to do with that, you reject God, guess what? You get rejected. It would be way better for those people not to become reprobate, not to have known, than to know and reject. Because then there would still be hope for them. But look at verse number 22. But it has happened unto them, according to the pr true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. So you know what I don't see? I don't see gay. I don't see happiness. I don't see rainbows. I see dogs eating vomit. That's what I see. It's disgusting. It's vile. You know what? We need to see things through the lens of the Holy Scripture of the Word of God because this is truth this cuts through the lies this cuts through the facade that the world's gonna try to convince you hey sin isn't that bad hell isn't really that hot it's not that big of a deal yes it is yes it is and if you want to know the truth get your your eyes in this book and read and learn and keep coming back to this church over and over and over again and learn the Word of God 
you don't want to be like the church of Laodicea. And I'll close on this. If you want to turn to Revelation 3, you can. The big problem, one of the big problems with the church of Laodicea is that they didn't have a proper spiritual view of themselves. They put off the spiritual glasses and continued their life and thought that everything was just great because they've been kind of walking blindly for a while. I mean, without the spiritual glasses, you're blind. How do you know what to believe? How do you know what's true? In, in, a, lot, in, in a world that is just increasing with the lies. I mean, I don't even, these days, I don't even know what's going on anywhere in the world anymore. I mean, we're being told there's bombs dropping and everything else. They probably are, but how do you know anything about, like, who started that? How do we know that the bombs that, that supposedly Hamas sent wasn't actually sent by Israel themselves. How do we know that? I don't know. I'm not saying that is what happened. I'm just saying things are so screwed up these days and the media is so owned that you're just going to be told whatever the, the spiritual wickedness in high places and, the, and, the, and the, the, the wicked workers of this world want you to think. That's what you're going to get. So it's just sort of like, it's hard for me to even speak on those things because it's just like, I have no clue what's really happening there. I don't even know. You can't trust it. But I don't need to know all of those things because I know what the Bible says. You, you, know, you know what needs to happen? The, the, the Palestinians and the, and the Jews need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't need to be sending bombs to anyone. How about sending Bibles? Right. This was the condition of the church of Laodicea. Look at verse number 17, Revelation chapter 3. The Bible says, Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. God's blessing us. What, what's the problem, bro? And this is modern America Christianity. Oh, you must be doing something wrong. You got all these people protesting and hating you and everything. Like, Read your Bible. Prosperity gospel is a false gospel. Look at the church of Laodicea. Hey, we're rich. We've got tons of goods. We don't need anything. Yeah, that's the problem. You think you don't even need God, apparently. And knowest not that thou art... God's like, hey, put on the glasses. You're like, oh, I'm great. I got all this clothing. Uh-oh. I didn't know that I was wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Like, <laughs> I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. And look, that was a letter sent to a church that God still had thought was a, a legit church. About to be removed. But the, the warning and the admonition, the letter was still sent to that church to warn them. We don't ever want to get in that condition, that spiritual condition. Put on the spiritual glasses so you can see through the lies and see through the truth. God gave you the wisdom that you need. Trust his word. Have that faith so you can walk by faith and not by sight. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we love you. We thank you so much for, for all the wisdom that you give us in, in your word. And we thank you for your great testimony and that you don't lie and that um, we can believe every word of the Bible, God, and, and, and trust that, that you want what's best for us and that we can follow. In, in a world full of lies, we can be guided and led by your word, dear Lord. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving us uh, the truth. I pray that you would please help us to uh, be able to dispel all the doubts, all the deceits, and, and to be able to have clarity in our understanding from your word, dear Lord. We love you. Uh, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.